Hello, welcome to Miami Beach Urban Studios Live Art Talk. I'm Colette Mello, and I'm here today with multidisciplinary artist and FIU alumni, Monica Lopez de Victoria. I wanna thank the City of Miami Beach Department of Tourism and Office of Cultural Affairs for sponsoring these art talks. Monica Lopez de Victoria is a multidisciplinary artist, performer, and artistic synchronized swimming. For the past 20 years, Monica has woven these two art forms together. Her colorful geometric aquatic performances, videos, and textiles investigate emotional volume and space and movement in the fourth dimension. Monica's artwork has been featured in international exhibitions such as Uncertain States of America, American Art, and the Third Millennium, curated by Hans Ulrich Oprist, Daniel Birnbaum, and Gunnar B. Carvern, the Moscow Biennale of Contemporary Art and Performa in New York City by Rosalie Goldberg. Her work has been seen and written about in La Officiel Magazine, The Guardian, Step Inside Design, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Vogue Italia, and the cover of Art News Magazine. Monica's artwork is also part of the permanent collection of the Van Ab Museum in the Netherlands and the Perez Art Museum Miami, as well as other public and private collections. Monica has participated in residencies in Canada, New Zealand, Mexico, and the US, and has recently been supported by the Bauhaus Foundation for residency projects in Germany and South Korea. Monica has also exhibited here at Miami Beach Urban Studios and was, it was part of the last exhibition here before the lockdown. She is an FIU BFA graduate. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box below. Hi, Monica, thank you for joining us. Hello, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. Thanks so much for um, just uh, allowing me to come back and, and uh, present things that I've done um, in the past and what things are going on currently. So thank you so much. So and tell us where you are and you can share your screen. Sure, let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. All right. So here we go. You can see it and everything. We're good. Yes, you look good. Yep. Great. Well, uh, thanks everybody for joining in. Uh, I am Monica Lopez de Victoria. I am half Puerto Rican, half uh, American, German, Swedish. And so uh, I've grown up in Miami. And like Colette said, a multimedia artist and performer. Um, but I consider myself um, Miami-based, Miami always. And I think uh, Miami has been a, a very important factor for my influences. So uh, speaking of influences, uh, these are some of the things that have um, been going through my work for the past over 20 years. So I graduated from FIU in uh, 2002 so that was quite a while ago um, and have been continuing to make work this whole entire time. And so some of the things here, here, like ripples, scientific interference, just different energy, uh, light and darkness, um, geometry patterns, art deco history in Miami, uh, uh, the weather, movement, textiles, um, just technology and definitely thinking forward into the future. So uh, the first 20 years, I worked with my sister, Tasha, and we went by the TM sisters. And so that was a, a long time of working together as a collaborative. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through some of the, basically the, the a lot of, of the work from the past as well as current stuff. So I will, show you now. So I'm going to go through medium. And when we both started making work, we were really into zines and photocopying, uh, as well as, as just kind of like collaging a lot together. Um, we we're both really interested in digital things, but couldn't afford 
getting anything um, to film or document, uh, especially early on in the career. So collage and then collaging animations um, were a big part of the beginning works. Also, we went to a lot of concerts and music was really influential. So here you see uh, some photocopy uh, crowds uh, at like a punk show that we had gone to when we were younger. But also um, she and I grew up as uh, pastor's daughters. And so we're always aware of light and darkness, I guess, in the world and in the air, uh, whether you want to call it spiritual energy um, or scientific energy, um, the weather and, and what's in the sky and what's around people were really important. Also, these, this upside down palm tree idea um, for us was connection with the divine. So I think you'll see a lot of like light and darkness uh, um, with us trying to figure out like all the unseen things around us. So a lot of the work has to do with like, I guess, self um, discovery and self understanding. And that's been a constant theme for all these years. So this is um, watercolor and it has multimedia pieces. So, so in there is textiles as well as iridescent stickers um, that I would cut out and kind of fit into these different shapes. And my sister's background is in painting and mine is in photography. So um, that kind of influenced our working together in different ways. So this one here it has to do a lot with like the emotion um, that goes behind uh, different, different activations and different things that were going on um, at the time. And this one actually continued on to go onto a Bex bottle and they produced that work. But look at that. Uh, we were able to switch it up. So originally it was like that upside down, but then her you see the energy shooting out of her hands, but then also little tiny drops coming out of her eyes, um, these tears basically, and it was a little bloody. Um, but then for, for Bex, we wanted to kind of keep it a little bit more safe, I guess you could say, and we had the tears going up. And uh, I guess also we were interested in kind of changing it up. So. Each time we do a work, um, quite often we will rehash an old work or, or take an idea and move it forward. So um, even old works don't have to stay static. Um, they can keep on living in new ways. So that one continued to live like this. And so a lot of these collages as well had to do with um, just kind of like being a, a a female and understanding just kind of the chaos that that uh, can come about with emotions and ideas and how that shines through and just the unknown, not knowing how to how to communicate, but through visual. Um, we grew up, I guess, not really knowing how to speak very well as far as emotions. It came out in a lot of the work. And now I'm able to speak more about it directly, but back then it was hard to process. And we were homeschooled, so socially kind of not so, uh, not so skilled on the speaking. So artwork I think was really a way for us to work together and speak in a different way. And even it was just a fun kind of playful experience. Like for example, she would do like the painting and I would do a lot of this geoma geometric um, patterning. And I think a lot of times creating is sometimes a process of, of it's, it's a process to process things as well as, you know, creating a, a visual final product. But I, I believe that, that the act of creating is, is really um, sometimes what can get you through things or help process ideas and feelings. So for me to get obsessive with these little lines and rulers um, helped me, I guess, channel a certain type of energy that I didn't know how to talk about. And uh, so here's more dark pieces, another tear. And so we would really approach a project with a lot of playfulness um, because it was always an experiment, always trying to see what we could come up with. 
Uh, and it was always like a conversation between the two of us um, when we were collaborating, even if you know there's just one final result. So this is a bunch of collages here. Often we would get bored, I, I think, with just showing things normally. And so anytime we got our hands on a new way of doing something, we would really play and, and try to push it for ourselves to see you know, what new things we could see. So those collages were put um, onto a photocopy background. And then we were using the uh, theater lighting for the gallery at David Castillo Gallery um, to just kind of accentuate ideas. So a lot of these pieces here were made with mirrors. Uh, I learned how to cut up mirrors. And to be honest, I will not do that again because <laughs> it's very dangerous. And so there's only that one series with um, actual mirrored glass. But then also thinking about um, hypnosis and kind of repeated patterns. Uh, so we would put these artworks on this background to kind of just like infiltrate the uh, wavelengths and um, put people in a mood when you are looking at it. And too, just it was different and it was fun to just try something different. So a lot of um, shiny iridescent um, things that uh, were, are in the sky. Uh, a lot of these are, are personal photographs then just cut out and then uh, put with multimedia different just different textures and things that we had around the studio. So like that golden image around her or behind her head here, uh, that was just a, a big giant sticker that we had come across. So a lot of our work in the studio was a lot of just gathering things that caught our attention, caught an energy, caught a light uh, or caught a darkness um, in the feeling. And so these also, uh, the sunset images here were from photos that I had taken and then cut out the clouds and cut out the darkness. More mirrored. So that's a little bit about the, the collage, so digital video. So the collage work really informed the video work because at first we didn't have, like I said, we didn't have any anything to actually record video. So this here is a still and it's a bad still because technology back then was a lot worse, but it is a piece that we did for a, a cooperative, a collaborative show um, called Cooperate where we had a bunch of different artists come together uh, or they were all making work together. A lot of the people in Miami um, 20 years ago. And so we decided to have everybody give each other superpowers. And so let's see here. So that's Adler Guerre. And, um, and look at that green screen. Oh my goodness, that's Jen Stark right there, David Ron. Um, technology back then though, we didn't really know how to green screen that well and you couldn't green screen that well. It was super hard. So now looking back at this, it's like, oh, oh my goodness. You know, oh my God, it's like, I can't even look at it. But, but this piece traveled the world. <laughs> you know, I, it was selected by Hans Ulrich Oberst when he was, happened to be in town, who, he happened to pass by this show that was in the design district. He happened, someone happened to have a key and due to all these random coincidences, this, this video ended up traveling the world. Um, we I were love very it. I love it. I love all the artists in it that you are naming. That's so yeah, great. Jeff Ming, Martin Oppel. I mean, it's just, we were all friends. The community was small. Gavin Perry, uh, Cooper, um, and, and just like back then, there really wasn't a big scene and and those those of the those, those of the people that went out were the ones that were also creating and so we really wanted to share that energy um jason hedges and just you know feel it out um so anyway i'm gonna skip this or skip forward. what year was this be... oh my goodness 2005 so this was one of your first video works uh no not necessarily it was just the one that got the most attention and where was uh, it where was it at it was at the um where did uh hans opris uh it? it went to it started in oslo there's a uh, lady in rodriguez casanova um it went there's hernan boss who's one of miami's most well-known painters yeah. uh yeah. 
and um, it started off in um, Norway. There I am, much younger version of myself. Um, and Kevin Arrow. Um, and so it went to the Netherlands, it went to France, it went to many different countries in Europe, and it came to the US as well. Um, I'm just gonna say this. Fantastic. <laughs> Boss Fisher, <laughs> Naomi. Okay, and so there's that still of me. And why am I showing this? Um, because it ended up a of it getting onto Art News Magazine cover, uh, which is awesome. But you notice that's not the real still, not at all. So why? Uh, because our digital uh, file was not, it, it was many years later that they wanted to put it on the cover and our file was just not good enough uh, to go on a cover. So we had to recreate it and fake it. And by that point, technology had gotten better. Our programs had gotten better. We knew how to green screen better. Uh, and so we had to fake fake the bad green screen on this on this uh, still. And fortunately, I still had the dress so I could do it. Um, and one thing I wanna say is that sometimes, you know, ideally, you know, maybe you'd given, be given a week deadline at least, no, to do this. And in order to get this on the cover, they needed it by the next day. And we didn't have it, we didn't have it. So, we had to stay up all night and you know make this as quickly as possible to turn it in the next day so that they would put it on the cover wow. so i mean you got to be ready because that's a great story yeah yeah it is it's pretty crazy <laughs> but that's how it happens quite often unfortunately more times than we would hope for anyways okay so back to video um this is a piece that uh, has to do, it's called Future Time. And it goes forward and backwards. It's meant to loop. So at first, you'll see that her movement is leading, is leading actually her. And then it'll bounce and flip. And then she'll be leading that energy or the movement, uh, repeated movement behind her. Uh, so at times it's about, you know, like maybe predestined things, maybe not, you know, it, it's about looking into the future a little bit um, and just feeling it out through an emotion and a body presence. All right, so we're gonna go next. And this is another video that we did for the Arsh Center. We did a live performance to this um, and collaborated with um, an artist or a musical artist named Million Young. And in a lot of the work that I do, I love collaborating with musicians. Um, a lot of my inspiration comes from music and comes from the music past uh, that I've had. And so this is a collaboration. So this is what would start the performance, but we also made it into snippets. <laughs> Thank you. 
So I'll go into a little bit of backstory with that piece. Um, it had to do, it was called Shimmer and at the Arsh Center, um, it had to do with, it was a whole piece that had to do with like the moment um, where the, the daytime met the nighttime. And so it was this kind of like light and darkness battling. Um, and we had that live in person, but then also we had uh, a lot of that energy in the, in the music and the video. So video installation, um, we would get bored with just showing just a straight video. So we started getting into um, alternative ways to show video. Uh, also, just so you know a little bit of history, um, we would DJ a lot. So at concerts for our friends, either DJs or, or bands, we would do live um, mixing of video. And so that really like loosened up our editing and loosened up a lot of like playfulness as far as like a digital media. So here is a projection. Um, it's, you see a silhouette of a woman and um, you see a little circle on the bottom and that's actually a mirror. And so you'll see parts of the texture of the video being projected in another area of the gallery. And um, so here is also uh, a musician giving a live score to the video that is being um, projected at David Castillo Gallery for the opening. Um, we would quite often we'll work with the whole kind of picture. Um, so even his, his outfit would be reflective of other elements in the show. Uh, this video was projected through a prism. And so it would ab you know, make it really abstract. And the show was called Prisma or Prisma Volt. And so it has to do with like the energy as well as uh, colors and shifting. So you see that it's not just a normal rectangle. Uh, it's abstracted through uh, color shifts from that prism over on the left. You can see that more, more noticeably. And then also it kind of uh, layers it up in a weird way. So that's just a regular rectangle video. And then um, it just abstracts it on the edges. I love it. Uh, another installation of uh, sculpture piece with a video that was in that show. Here's a still of it. We shot video through a crystal. And so it has all these different prism angles of the sunset and someone giving uh, thanks to that sun. Also getting into sculpture and playing with the video and light uh, with uh, rainbows and what prisons give off. So we do a lot of installations at nightlife and hotels and different events. So. Anytime we would get a new piece of equipment, we'd really just try to push it and experiment. And so this time was at the James Hotel in South Beach and they had these video projectors that would move around. And so we were able to create animations and video that, that would line up and change and shift. And so even before projection mapping was very popular, we were really into um, customizing the framing for video at different events and different places. So interactive video, um, over on the right side, that's my brother, he's a programmer. Uh, I'm second from the left and my sister's there on the left. And um, here we are meeting a very well-known uh, happy artist, uh, if anyone recognizes him, <laughs> uh, Japanese, hint. Um, so yeah, we, the three of us would work together, uh, my brother programming, my sister doing more of the animation and me doing a bit more of the, the building. So this piece was purchased by the Van Abbott Museum. And uh, so it has to do with uh, an interactive piece that you'd have to get on top of this controller that uh, it's kind of like an old fashioned DDR. Back then the DDR game, um, Dance Dance Revolution was popular. And so being able to put two sensors underneath there and building the tech that had to do with um, the video interaction was really exciting for us. And um, I believe our first one was either in 2005. Yeah, 2005. So this was before even 
people were doing interactive or video game art in the gallery. Um, actually, even the Rebels came and said, why do you have a video game at a gallery? <laughs> they didn't understand it back then. But look at where we are now. And a lot of people are doing this. So yeah. And here is a controller that's built underneath a carpet in a black room. Uh, this is a piece, it's called Debris. And it had to do with uh, going through different levels of a hurricane and different types of debris being thrown at you. And you're this flying character, which is there on, on, in the yellow. And you'd have to avoid the different um, objects and catch the little orbs so that your aura would grow bigger and fill the screen. And so that was a goal um, that you'd have to constantly be pushing on uh, and maneuvering. So we also have done the video, interactive video on buildings. So this one was in the Drake Hotel in Toronto, Canada. And here is one of the videos of that. Anyways, okay, so uh, that is one thing to do. And so murals also just suddenly became uh, more of a thing. And this was before Wynwood really blew up, I guess. I mean, Wynwood's always been there. It's always been a graffiti spot and a mural spot. Um, but before that, that's a lot of people were into it as an art form. So this piece, actually, you can't even see it anymore. Uh, this is in Hollywood, Florida. Uh, we wanted to do it's called rise set so it has to do with also the sun you know rising or setting and uh we painted this building um it took a month to do with two other people helping so four of us painting this on a big uh, lift scissors lift and uh, boom lift and so we wanted to allow the building to blend into the sky at different times of of what the sky looked like and, and help erase, you know, that, I guess, that architectural element. But now, now they built another building right in front of it where that, uh, that whole right side is basically behind a building now. So you only see the left side. And there we are, painting it up. This is another building. This was our first one. Uh, it was in downtown Miami and it was uh, our studio and they, we were given a big, large space with a bunch of other artists, but um, the Downtown Development Authority really wanted the previous mural to be covered up. So the only way we could do it is, uh, well, we had to, in order to be in the space, we needed to cover it up, uh, even though the, the previous mural was Captain Harry's and it was historical. And so to honor that, even though we had to uh, cover it, um, it was that we kept the water level line. And actually, Tasha and I and Tom Wheeler, um, we, we collaborated on this building here. And so we, we kept the water, we changed it to black to you know, signify certain things that were happening. And this, this was done over 10 years ago. So maybe about 15 years ago. Some elements and details. Then you know, eventually, it was right next to club space. So imagine it, it uh, got, quite graffitied up. Um, this is a corporate commission. So sometimes, you know, we'll get these corporate asks and um, it was for Lacoste on the flagship store on South Beach. And so, you know, they wanted a croc that was like their specifications. And so we had it, um, we built it out of styrofoam and then coated it with resin and um, did it in pieces. It's very light then. Uh, and did that mural to coordinate with the energy of that. Another mural piece. 
This is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We did a performance with it. We wanted to work with optical illusions. And then again, that upside down palm tree connecting with the idea of paradise or, or the disillusion of paradise. Uh, and so um, actually we'll see a little bit later more of this. So you notice this, the roller skates in there, keep that in mind. This is another one that's still actually up on, um, on 7th Avenue. So thinking about a lot about uh, Art Deco and, and uh, geometry and shapes. This was uh, commissioned by Ulight and it was in one of the Walgreens windows. And as the person walked past it, um, the, those crossing sections where those vertical lines would pass behind the the other lines, um, it would kind of give an optical illusion effect when you would walk. So video performance. So uh, for Performa, we were able to do this piece and um, it didn't have much, it didn't actually have video footage. It was all animation uh, because back then we didn't have any, any cameras. So we had to do it all stop motion. And so we put ourselves in it and figured out that by you know projecting white, it was like a spotlight, uh, and we're able to perform this. This was at the. This is another piece, um, and it was at, Mam, which is now Pam, Pam, and it had to do with um, three sisters that got thrown overboard from a Miami party boat, <laughs> and they found each other by singing, and um, it had to do with the idea of. Um, just uh, being lost and, and finding each other. So we also, like I mentioned before, would VJ. Uh, and this was at Set Nightclub, which existed for a little minute on South Beach. Uh, and we would be able to play with like really large projections and um, you know, learn about you know, how people would react to different types of, of uh, lighting, different types of textures, different subject material. And you know, basically it was kind of like dancing through video because it was all live. We would come with a bunch of files uh, in our computers and then just whatever the DJ would put on, we would feel it out and just like feel that energy. And so it was really fun. It was a lot of fun. So athletic performance and installations. But as I mentioned, I was homeschooled. And so this is what we looked like growing up, all three of us homeschoolers um, from Florida. And yes, my parents would dress us like this quite often. Um, but we learned to really just really fall in love with our own place. And since I was homeschooled, I had to do uh, PE somehow. And so I joined um, a swim team. And then on the same pool, there was a synchronized swimming team. So there you see my 13 year old self there swimming. <laughs> and that really influenced a lot of um, current work because I was able to swim in a lot of the Art Deco pools on South Beach. Um, I was very, very aware of geometry and body coordination. Uh, and just like thinking about this is the entertainment side. Anyways, I'm going to skip that because that's, that's funny, <laughs> but that's how I would, um, I guess, survive being an artist as I would get gigs um, doing the synchronized swimming. So finally in um, 2009, we got a show at Locust Projects and no one knew that we were also athletes. So I was a synchronized swimmer. My sister was a jam roller skater. And so we brought in an above ground pool into Locust Projects, suspended these mirrors above it and did a basically a West Side Story battle that uh, had to do with um, uh, our, our pasts and, and our um, athletic sports. So that's me. There's more geometry, I guess. We'll go into that. So just performing around a lot made me very aware. Oh, it's again. 
there's my sister. Um, and so she had a bunch of jam roller skaters and she would do tricks and same reason we were homeschooled and had to do something athletic and it actually really just stuck with us. And so we brought it into a lot of art. So these were also jam trick roller skaters uh, and we were able to dress them up and make a art athletic performance. And it was called World Crash Gro sorry, World Crash Go. And it had to do with uh, the, our backgrounds getting mashed up together, uh, just kind of like a West Side Story idea where um, two sides would battle through talent and um, you know come together basically at the end. So that was a space we were able to paint it out, build it out and project around. We even were able to get the firefighters to fill up the pool in Locust Projects. And uh, there's my sister's um, skating group and we did more installations that started taking off and doing more performance work as well as like collaborating with, with athletes and, and working with videos and installations. So we built a huge uh, floor here for the community to, to skate in. And it was at Three Points Music Festival. Um, this one was probably about five years ago. And um, this is the piece that we painted the floor uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We worked with the, the local roll, roller derby team and uh, a band that was consisted of two brothers as well. And it was called the Unstoppable Death Machines. And the piece's name was Join Me in a Land That Knows No End. And uh, we had the skaters go around basically turning up that energy around that palm tree and uh, along the ground and to create a vortex uh, in this idea of while the musicians were playing uh, their instruments as well. Some more installation shots. And uh, since I wasn't a, as great of a skater, I was more of a saint figure. And then uh, at Faena, we worked with Assume Vivid Astro Focus and um, my sister was able to get more skaters and we activated uh, different nights of their community skating uh, time. So we did the videos and had the activations while uh, Assume Vivid Astro Focus, he had the big giant sticker on the bottom of the floor as well as that center DJ console spot. So a lot of the work, even a lot of our work would have to do with uh, community as well. We really loved being able to open things up and make it accessible because a lot of art stuff hasn't been accessible. And to just to make it fun to, you know, stir up that energy and really um, move it and get people to move. That's my sister right there skating backwards. So uh, my sister moved away and she's been climbing mountains for the past three years. <laughs> <laughs> all over the United States. So that meant that I needed to do work on my own. Uh, FIU sent us to the Bauhaus and um, unfortunately my sister was able, not able to make it because she fell ill at the time. Um, and so anyways, I found this pool in the city of Dessau where the Bauhaus school is. Um, I was able to live in Oscar Schlemmer's um, master house and uh, this pool really just caught my attention because yeah, it's just gorgeous. And um, this is something that really hit me uh, while I was studying over there. Uh, Oscar Schlemmer's um, drawings of geometry and emotional volume and just the idea of, of space and movement and energy and emotion. Um, and I just thought it was incredible. So it deeply affected my, what I was already thinking of, but then it translated it and elevated it in a different way. Um, something at another um, residency that I came across was this scientific interference. And so just you know, looking at these patterns and shapes and thinking about waves and overlapping of energies. Um, and just when those things move, it creates, creates optical illusions. So here is um, the master house. This is a photograph from a book that they had printed 
Um, but I was able to use this space and wow, it was such an honor. And, you know, I will forever be grateful to FIU for making this happen because for three months, I was able to work in this historical building and just like soak up the energy and, and really, you know, try to understand, you know, what was so special about that era, that movement. And, and so I was really studying a lot of like why, you know, how in, in their thought process and, and why it was so successful and why it was so crazy, the history over there. Um, and, and what I came out of it realizing also is that they really made, would make a parenthesis of, of, you know, rules, but then also have this space to, to experiment in. So they, they played a lot. They had a lot of costumes, a lot of performance. Um, and so it was really super congruent with all of my past work and moving forward. So while I was there, I was doing a lot of sewing and watercolor, thinking about just, you know, oh, these ideas of, of radiating shapes and, and dual, dueling energies as well, or just thinking about kind of multi -la multiple layers at the same time. So I got access to that pool that I fell in love with in Dessau, and I got some athletes um, from a, a synchronized swimming team in Berlin. They came out there, which is two hours away. I put them in green screen suits and um, shot them in this pool. And I, it, was, it was awesome. And I was so grateful to be able to do this. Uh, I learned that, yes, maybe green is not the best color for even though green screen in the air is good, underwater, yellow turns green. And so that I had a very hard time keying that out. But see, like, look at how similar that background is, you know, to the costuming. So that's me underwater directing these amazing athletes. So then I would key it out. So the final piece was a video that had these athletes and then also textures and shapes that I was um, shooting constantly over there. So these are stills from the video. called chroma casting. So it kind of had to do with, you know, the idea of casting spells, but then also, you know, just the idea of using colors to kind of influence and, uh, colors and shapes. <laughs> Anyways, that's just a snippet. Um, that piece also, I worked with another musician named Richard Haig. Uh, and so then after that piece, um, I was very honored to be able to go to Korea. Bauhaus nominated me to be one of three artists. They uh, asked um, if we wanted to go to, to South Korea. And um, the museum over there, uh, I'm very, very grateful. Um, they selected uh, my work. And so I was able to go spend three months um, 
over in South Korea. So this right here has to do with like layering. I was uh, talking about process here. Uh, so this is just to understand a little bit about like the creation here. This has three layers, um, the layer of the hands and clouds, which was shooting up from underneath the water to the sky and then peeing out that actual water, adding in a drawing that was actually moving uh, and then water also. So uh, those are three different layers. And just, I love combining and, and even just like doing a mashup of, of videos and seeing what happens. And I, I know that for sure comes from DJing, just being playful with that. Here it is. Um, it was uh, shown in another city. It traveled around Korea a little bit. And this was on a screen that was four stories high. And here it is at the NSU Museum. I did an audio collaboration with Susie Green. And this piece had to do with uh, a bit about healing. Um, it was called the Ripples Surface Surfacing. And it had to be. I created it during a time that was a little rough emotionally for me. So I was coming out of a dark place. And for me, making our work uh, helps me process my emotions um, and figure things out a little bit better, hopefully. <laughs> so this is an experiment I did and I was really happy with it where I projected an oval video that I had created um, on top of a video screen on the wall. And so at times there's that same texture in the video in the rectangle. And so to me that blurred like the boundaries of uh, the actual screen and where it blends to the wall. Anyways, and so now, right now, I just got some funding to, from Oolight to, to do a piece that is a AR VR piece um, called Swamp Deco. And it has to do with uh, I'm the architecture going underwater in the future on uh, the year 2300. So Swamp Deco, surrealist artwork, underwater awareness experience. And it has to do with what the future will look like when climate change happens in South Florida. And these are, this is the vision board or the mood board. Um, and so this is like where we are headed. And I'm actually working with my brother on this one. And so, we will see upcoming piece. And I just finished up this piece called Submerging Geometry along with O Miami um, Poetry Festival and the city of Miami Beach. And it had to do with uh, basically this time that we have been through. So I had all these performers and everybody went, half of them were dancers and half of them were artistic swimmers. And so I was, I've been wanting to do projections with performance, but to get a lot of performers, you need a bigger budget and that never happened until now. And so we worked with another artist named Monica Uzerowitz. She's a writer and a poet and she, um, based off of the movements we were making, she created a poem out of our movements. And so here is how it starts. I don't have actual video of it yet. Um, but that will soon come. So it had to do with um, these polarity, polarity, polarity ideas of, you know, our mind and our heart and how sometimes our mind and our heart are at odds with each other or for how to have both of them find a balance. So the dancers were more of um, the heart and the, the artistic swimmers were more of the mind because they're more geometric, more like angular, more uh, structured and the dancers were more fluid and moving. And so you see the dancers here with that projection um, as well. So that's why I had them in white. It also is a bit spiritual. Some people said Santeria <laughs> looking, um, but it was really a fun experiment for me. So I'll just kind of, pile through these 
images. And so this was bringing together my entertainment um, swimming with basically abstract art and um, you know, merging the two and bringing in having about 20 performers, really creating these beautiful moments and shapes in the water. There's more of our perform more of the poem. Yes, so, and that is about it. Uh, I have- We have- um, Basically, that is that part. The only other thing I had is that um, my day job right now is the Cancer Institute. Um, I'm an artist in residence at the Cancer Institute. And so uh, this is a little video about We that. have um, positioned it in such a way throughout the Institute that it has been. Oh my, where did it go? We have um, positioned it in such a way and the objective is to engage the patients in the arts, whether it's visual or performing arts. And these artists are positioned in the lobbies, in the waiting areas of the clinic, as well as in the treatment areas in the infusion center. And so patients have the opportunity to engage in any of these arts as they are walking through the building or if they're in the waiting rooms, they are invited to either actively participate by creating artwork or um, singing along with the um, musicians or they can passively engage. But anyways, that is a little taste of what my day job is. Um, and so that is basically uh, where I'm at now. And thank you, you all, for paying attention this far. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know if they have any questions or thoughts. Monica, that was really a wonderful presentation. Your work is amazing. Um, and I am very interested in what you're doing with the Cancer Institute, because we talked briefly about how art is therapy. And I've always thought that, and you were talking about your day job and that's when you shared that. So it's amazing, but I'm really interested in your work has a lot of your experimentation. And I want to ask you about that. And also how do you feel about making mistakes? Cause I would think that would go hand in hand, but it doesn't seem like it just if you talk about that, because you and you talk about technology, like you were doing technology when it was just starting out. So if you would talk about all of that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think something to, that is still holds true is to um, fail often and early. <laughs> I've heard that quote before. And and it's important. I mean, I think opening yourself up for possible failure is really naked and raw and it's scary but i think you know if if you can experiment or if i can experiment and be honest with myself with trying to push ideas um you know there have been times that i have definitely failed in front of everybody um and those are learning moments and so you know i've learned to keep working but then you know as you keep going to you know push this, those those failed experiments to the side. And um, I, I think being comfortable with, it, it, it forces me to be comfortable with being in the moment and, and trusting the process um, because it's scary. And, you know, especially when things get to higher levels, it doesn't get any less scary. Uh, but when you are honest and when you're making honest work that is reflective on, you know, like my life experiences or what I'm dealing with, like even if it's depression or um, trying to understand my own emotions or the battles of my own emotions, my head and my heart or, or my uh, spiritual upbringing or not, you know, the science and religion, you know, like these polarities battling. So I know that when my sister and I were working together, we would have an external a conversation about these ideas. And so now I'm working solo. It's just more inside my own head. Um, and, and, but it still uh, flows out. And I think it, it's scary all the time, but why not? You know, life is scary. Might as well make it fun and, and 
exciting. <laughs> you talk about that too. You say your work is very, you're playful, you're experimenting and fun. So you talk about that as well. So I think that's really important for, you know, don't you? Or of course you do. So. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, uh, you know, when, when we get into the same pattern or, or feel confident in something, then, you know, maybe it's not getting pushed further or forward. And, and um, I guess that naked rawness is, is a place that I really like to create in, even though every single time I'm like, why am I doing this? You know, <laughs> like, what did I do to myself? I should have like, you know, made it simpler or I don't know. I, I get these visions and I want to see if I can do it mostly, I think, um, you know, like, okay, I have this idea, but like, is that even possible? Um, and no one's ever maybe mixed these kind of things, at least in my circles. Well, it's, it's amazing what you're doing. So I have another question regarding your new project, Swamp Deco, and it's about sea level rising and in the 2300s. Can you talk about that a little bit, the components that are going into all of that? And when do you first yeah, yeah. be finished or? Well, it's not started yet. Um, okay. It's only in the development um, part. And so now we just got funding um, from Ulight for this and- Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it actually makes it go forward then. <laughs> Uh, and so it has to do with like looking forward and into the future where like, okay, climate change has happened and our historical architecture pieces have gone underwater. And um, so basically you're dropped into the future and you're gonna have to try to reverse time, uh, you know, by maneuvering through these buildings um, at the different levels at, at each kind of like progress, progression of going backwards in time. And it, it's not supposed to be like a big like activist kind of piece. It's more of a subtle, um, soft reminder that this is this is like our potential future, and it's very very real. And so I think like this has to come up in more of our conversations, and it is. So it's something that will hopefully give us a glimpse into the future, so it doesn't happen. I hope so. That's so interesting. Well, I want to. Um, it's. It's 6.30, I wanna um, respect everyone's time. But Monica, it was really great to see you and to hear your voice and to get to hear about your your works. Um, I look forward, and your, I remember your exhibition here was really wonderful and I loved the video that you had with the hands and it was really wonderful. And so I look forward to hopefully seeing you soon. Um, I mentioned we're gonna be going to face-to-face -to -face events shortly. Hopefully soon everybody's getting vaccinated and we're all, COVID trends are going, are, and are good. So I just want to say thank you again. Thank everyone, everybody for joining us and um, stay safe. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye, Monica. Thank you. Bye, thank you so much. Have a good night.